As long as I'm President of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley. And I am Naz Modirzadeh. Welcome to this new episode of Hold Your Fire. So Naz, this week we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're going to dispense with our week in review. We're going to start with our main interview with Nigar Gexel, who's our senior analyst, crisis group senior analyst in Istanbul, in Turkey. And she's going to talk to us about, well, Turkey's foreign policy, its involvement in conflicts around the region. I mean, of late it's been involved in Syria and Iraq and Libya in the Eastern Mediterranean, and now in Nagorno-Karabakh. And so we were going to talk to her about what's behind that policy, what it means, and what it doesn't. And then we are going to turn to our analyst in Azerbaijan. You know, last week we spoke to uh, Olesia, who uh, spoke to us more from the Armenian side of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. That conflict is still ongoing, and we thought it would be really good to have somebody who's been living it very personally from the Azerbaijani side, Zahar Shireyev, and he'll be joining us from Baku. So, Nigar, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you, Rob. It's great to join you and us. So, Nigar, you're, you've been our Turkey project director now for the past uh, five years. Uh, you know Turkey inside out as well as anyone, and I always rely on you to try to understand the country, understand what we get wrong and what we sometimes might misinterpret from the outside. So that's where I'd want to begin. If you've been living in the West as I have, if you live in the United States, and you follow the, the overall commentary about Turkey, it really has been quite striking of late for the past few years. Um, and there's much we could talk about, but, but you know, let's just take the last few weeks. People are looking at Turkey's involvement in northern Syria, military involvement, both in the northwest and in the northeast. It's looking at Turkey's involvement uh, against the Kurds in Iraq, in, in Libya, on the side of the internationally recognized government, uh, in the eastern Mediterranean against Greece, against Cyprus, and now in Nagorno-Karabakh on the side of Azerbaijan. And, you know, there's really a sense of Turkey flexing its muscles, using proxy forces or mercenaries in the region in a way that, again, viewed from, from the outside, raises a whole host of questions and anxieties and, and, and concerns about what Turkey is really trying to do. So what I'd like to ask you first is, can you try to explain for all of us, for our listeners, what does it look like from a Turkish perspective? Well, I think from the perspective of, um, uh, of the ordinary Turk, let's say, or um, the mainstream, Turkey is surrounded nowadays by conflicts that um, Turkey didn't start and upheavals that it didn't create. And there's a view that there are no great solutions being offered by others for these conflicts. There's a perception of a power grab among regional powers for influence and the use of new, new methods such as proxies and mercenaries and a view that Turkey will get squeezed out of the region if it doesn't catch up. There's also a view that Turkey can't protect its strategic and economic interest without military projection in this scene, that multilateral platforms um, are not delivering win-win uh, solutions. There's also a very deep historical suspicion of the Euro-Atlantic, the sort of view that Turkey is trying to be contained. Um, there are historical reasons for that, but also more contemporary ones. And there's also a view that there's no higher ground, higher moral ground among other actors either. And um, sort of inconsistent, hypocr hypocritical uh, responses where you know, democracy be, will be evoked sometimes and UN resolutions only sometimes. And when it suits Western strategic interests, they talk about values, but when they don't, when it doesn't, they don't. And so this is the scene within which Turkey justifies um, some of those interventions that you mentioned. You know, it's, it's always fascinating for me, and it's what I like most about this job, frankly, is trying the fact that we could put ourselves or try to put ourselves in different shoes, very contrasting and competing shoes and try to see how things can be looked at very, the same thing can be looked at very differently. So what, what Nigar, would you say to those who see in what's happening today uh, in Turkish foreign policy as a sort of neo-Ottomanism or 
pan-Islamist project or both by President Erdogan. You know, that's the way that much of the world in the West at least looks at it. Yet listening to you, at least from a Turkish perspective, from the way many Turks view it, they believe they're under siege when many people outside believe that they're on the that they are the aggressors, that they are the ones who are on the offense. And that's true, as I said, in the West. It's also true of many in the Arab world, where they would look at Turkish policy and, and equate it with a more expansionist, again, as I said, new Ottoman or Islamist or combination of both. So I'd like to ask you whether that resonates with you or is that outside perception, that outside interpretation missing something? I think President Erdogan experimented over the years with different different constellations and approaches in, in internal and external um, alliances. He came to power, as you know, in, in 2002, so it's it's been... It's been almost 20 years. I think the formulas that he's been trying have been those that he would like to both add up in terms of him maintaining domestic power and at the same time increasing Turkey's regional power. And at different, different depending on uh, the electorate and the different power dynamics in the country and the regional equilibriums of power, the formula has changed. And right now, there is a convergence between the sort of Islamically oriented civilian and military elites and, and those that are sort of nationalistic and anti-Western in their strategic vision. And this right now is, is adding up in terms, of, in terms of the electorate as well, by and large. But there was a day when AKP first came to power where it was really the opposite that was tried. There was an effort to replace the securitized approach that had been long entrenched in Ankara with more inclusive liberal approaches, grant Kurdish rights, even even more rights to Christian minorities, uh, investment in European integration, soft power initiatives, sort of zero problems with neighbors, as you know. These didn't bear fruit. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of zigzags and, you know, not to justify the in domestic and, and, and foreign interventions. They do make arithmetic sense from the perspective of the strategic minds in Ankara today. Nigar, could I ask you to b- build on that a little bit? So why do they make sense? What, what is the sense of, what is Erdogan's ultimate goal here in your view? Well, the sense is, for, I mean, for example, when you, when you look at his earlier years, he confronted segments of the state in order to pursue reunification plan on Cyprus, the Annan plan, the UN Annan plan. The Greek, Greek Cypriots rejected it. He pursued the EU agenda with reforms that were very unpopular among the nationalists. But again, sort of the obstacles that Turkey confronted at the time were either civilizational, in that it's a Muslim country, can't join, that was sort of Sarkozy's line, or it was the veto of Cyprus after 2004. So people like me who were in the NGO sector then, we lost our ammunition in asking for reforms from Ankara because we were no longer able to say, if you carry out those reforms, we might actually be moving towards EU membership. The answer became... The door is already closed. And then they were, I mean, there were the 2009 uh, protocols with Armenia that were sort of stillborn, and we can talk about that, but it was a sort of an effort, again, a confrontation of the Turkish nationalists that w- would cost Erdogan votes inside and that didn't pan out and just didn't seem worth it. And then you also had the PKK peace process that, um, again, Erdogan took a l- risk, sort of confronted nationalists in the country by pursuing it. And then the argument from Ankara today would be that that PKK's affiliate in, in, in Syria, uh, YPG, got emboldened um, by U.S. support in Syria, and therefore they would say that's why that fell apart. So in a way, when you talk to people in Ankara that still are convinced that this is the right path, they say that they tried other means and it didn't, you know, it, it was both costing them domestically and it wasn't getting the results that they intended. So Turkey wasn't being met in the middle. And so in a way, you see this sort of no more Mr. Nice Guy I'm going to try another way, sort of gain military ground and maybe play hardball more. And, and Nigar, can I ask, is, it, is there a sense that the, the, the no more Mr. Nice Guy approach, is it paying off? Is there a sense that domestically this is a more surefire strategy or is there talk of a potential overreach here? Well, I mean, by now, power is consolidated to the extent that the Turkish electorate mostly hears Turkish narratives. The media also enables that. I think it depends on how the question is posed. Ultimately, has Turkey succeeded or not? It depends on how, how, what the Turkish population is presented was the alternative. 
if they think that the world has been trying to bring Turkey down and exclude Turkey from the region, then, then the president has been quite successful. You know, if it was if, if PKK was trying to create a corridor to Turkey's south and that corridor has been blocked then that's seen as a success. If there was going to be a pipeline across the East Med that uh, excluded Turkey, then spoiling that is a success. So it's, if it's a matter of preventing what was in store for Turkey that was worse, I think the electorate sees it as a gain. When we look at public opinion polls, what's what the problem of the political leadership today in terms of the risk of losing votes, it's not about foreign policy. By and large, the population is quite supportive of the foreign policy. Some interventions have been more popular than others, but by and large, I think they buy the narrative that this was uh, necessary. The economy is where I think the larger troubles lie. And so the effort is to to ensure that uh, these interventions don't make it harder for the government to deliver the economic expectations of the population. But there was a big postcard that I can refer to now that was on, on a building recently, and it, it spelled, um, we didn't vote for our president, I'm paraphrasing, to uh, bring the currency down. We vote, voted for him to make sure the country isn't brought down. So in a way, in the, even the economic difficulties are, can be justified if it's a matter of, of, of patriotism and keeping the Turkey stable. So, Nagar, now I want to sort of turn to another question, more in line with, uh, or, or very much in line with what Crisis Group does, what, what, what is key to Crisis Group's mandate, which is conflict prevention, conflict resolution. So, given everything that you've said so far, what, what I'd like to hear is, what do you think Turkey can do to have a more productive role in diffusing, uh, de-escalating conflicts across the region? Um, you know, regardless of how, of, of how one looks at it, whether it's, you know, look at the conflict in Libya or in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, many sides are exacerbating conflict. Many are pouring fuel on the fire. But Turkey is one of them. And it, it's not a matter of assigning sole blame to Turkey, but there's no doubt that Turkey has been an exacerbator and in some cases an instigator of, of violent conflict. So if you're looking at it from that perspective, to, really the question is what, what Turkey can do, but also uh, what's the best approach that others could take towards Turkey so that it doesn't escalate conflict, so that it doesn't send Syrian proxy fighters into battlefields, whether it's in Libya or Nagorno-Karabakh, so that it doesn't escalate tensions in the eastern Mediterranean or go after Kurds in, in, in northeast Syria. Again, I'm asking this not as a matter of assigning blame, but with an eye to our mission, which is to de-escalate, to prevent, and to resolve conflict. Tell us what we need to know about what Turkey is looking for, what it, what, it wants to, what it wants to get, what it wants to achieve, so that it would take its foot off the pedal and not double down in some of the conflict areas that it's currently involved in. I think there, there are um, two, two approaches to that, but um, the one that Turkey prefers, uh, that Ankara prefers right now, is to recognize Turkey's legitimate interests where they exist, and instead of excluding Turkey in those areas, to engage it in a sort of real politic, if necessary, transactional way. And I think that would also be a way to, to be able to gain the credibility to moderate the illegitimate pursuits of, of Ankara. And in other words, you know, if you engage the, um, the relatively constructive or pragmatic, let's say, segments in Ankara, then you empower them more vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the hardliners that do not want to find a middle ground. So I think, I mean, I would, I would think engagement is, um, is going to be more effective than exclusion. I mean, the other approach that some critics of Ankara have is really not delivering fruits, which is sort of this excluding and punishing approach, sort of sanctions or, or whatnot. And I understand the logic, sort of delegitimize the Ankara political leadership and not set a precedent for other countries to act like that, or the argument of not selling values for, for geostrategic in interests. But it's not working for another for a number of reasons. One is just the dynamic in Turkey. It's creating a rally behind the flag effect. And it's not that there's really an alternative on, on offer right now. I think it's not like there are any multilateral platforms or win-win initiatives that Turkey is rejecting to take a part in. If there were, I think that would probably be the way forward. I mean, if there were carrots that could be offered to Turkey, that the Turkish public could also mobilize around and sort of build in some conditionality that also involved better behavior, 
Of course, that would be ideal. Or if there were international mechanisms for the more effective resolution of, of conflicts. It's just that I, I don't see that they exist so that the Turkish public is not really putting a price tag on its own government for not taking part in something better that's not out there. Right. And, and you raise this issue of, of what's the best strategy for what could be the best strategy for Western countries. And we'll come to that in a second. But first, I want to ask you about another aspect of Turkish foreign policy, which has intrigued many, which is its relationship with Russia. As we all know, there was a crisis between Turkey and Russia when Turkey shot down a Russian plane over Syria. But since then, their relationship has improved quite dramatically. And what's extraordinary is to see that coexistence between quite close relations on the one hand, and on the other hand, the fact that they are on opposite sides of the battlefield in Syria, in Libya, and now potentially in Nagorno-Karabakh. So my question is, what's the sense, what understanding should we have of the Turkish-Russian relationship, which seems to be the dominant factor across conflict zones in the region? Is it a relationship of sort of mutual understanding and sort of mutual management of differences? Is it one that could escalate into something far worse as they do face each other on the battlefield? And how is this all viewed from Ankara's perspective? I think by and large, there, there, there isn't much trust of, of Russia, but there's a, a respect um, born out of the conviction that Russia is more likely to get its way than any other actor in the neighborhood, in the, in the areas that, that, that are critical for, for Turkey. Um, and it very much is a sort of a, a factor of, of how the Turkey sees the U.S., because the view has over the years increasingly been that the U.S. will meddle and then leave or it'll change course. And where has it actually been able to get what it strived for? And you'll, they'll list Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, Crimea, Syria. Um, uh, they think the U.S. is unpredictable. And there's a risk that if you side with the U.S., you're going to be punished by, by Russia and Iran down the line and sort of be left alone in the region um, with the vengeance of your neighbors who are not going anywhere. I think there's also a distrust among certain segments of the state of U.S. intentions. There's always been a conviction that the U.S. wanted to create a Kurdish state to the south of Turkey. There's also suspicions of, of the U.S. Um, sort of wanting a compliant leadership in, 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 in Ankara and sort of punishing uh, Ankara for, um, for, for being defiant. And you know, compared to that, I think the, the view is that as much as Turkey and Russia don't have shared interests, they support different sides of actually all the conflicts in our neighborhood, Libya, Syria, Nagorno-Karabakh, I mean, even Ukraine, Turkey hasn't taken much of a position, but different sides on, on every conflict. Yet, yet they seem to find a sort of transactional a platform to accept that each of, the, each, each of them have us consolidate their influence in certain segments of each of those countries. So far, I think it's um, at least been manageable. But one can also say it's not sustainable, or, or at least that, it, that Russian, Russia's gained so much leverage in some of these fields, and I would say Idlib in particular, because in, in, in Idlib, Russia's the only thing standing in, in front of a regime assault, which could bring millions of, of, of additional Syrian refugees to Turkey. That, that card is a very strong one in, in, in Russia's hands, and I think it's one that keeps Turkey to some extent um, constantly needing to be in the good graces of Russia, let's say. Um, so the, the leverage, unfortunately, on a number of fields, also in, in Libya in some ways as well, is, is more in Russia's hands. Nagar, so you've brought up uh, the U.S., and it, and it brings to mind for me a, a question I wanted to ask you. What is the sense within Turkey of Erdogan's relationship with the U.S. over these past 20 years? Um, ironically, when Erdogan first came to power, the sort of conventional wisdom in Turkish society was that the U.S. was instrumental in bringing him to power because he had um, agreed, supposedly, to enable the U.S. to enter Iraq in 2003 from using Turkish soil. And the fact that uh, Erdogan, before he was um, even elect, uh, became prime minister, went to Washington and met the president there was, was sort of presented as, as evidence to that. And then for a number of years ongoing, um, there was a view that the U.S. and, and he and President Erdogan were sort of in cohorts. Uh, so this whole sort of conception of a greater Middle East project and how 
Turkey and, and uh, with the president's leadership was going to play a role in, in, in moderating or taming the Middle East and be a model and, and be a leader of the Muslim Middle East. That whole idea was seen as something that was empowering President Erdogan um, to, the, to the detriment, let's say, of his opposition or, or, and the, the segments of society that preferred to frame Turkey as a, as a European country. Now, that changed, uh, I, I guess, after the Arab Spring, when, well, for one, the, the Muslim Brotherhood um, affiliates that the ruling government in Turkey had a close relationship with and sort of was creating an access with, as their fall was, was turned a blind eye to, for example, the, the, the coup that deposed of, of Morsi in Egypt, and then the Gezi Park protests, the, part, the protests against the government in, in, in Turkey, and they were all framed as sort of a, a U.S. effort to uh, weaken President Erdogan because he had stopped serving the U.S. strategic interests. So as Turkey's relations with, with, with Russia improved, as the president became more defiant about, about Israel, sort of tried to improve relations with Iran, the perception in Turkey is, is largely that the U.S. turned against him. And then, of course, the coup attempt in 2016 is framed accordingly as sort of a, a, something that the U.S. Was, was involved in. And it's after that coup attempt in particular that you see the anti-Euro-Atlanticist segments of, of, the, of, of, of Turkey coming together and along with, with the, the government now, both in the political uh, arena and the parliament, but also in the sort of state circles, um, really creating a front and a narrative that we need to protect against against the United States, that there's an effort to um, to instrumentalize Turkey and put a put a compliant leader on its um, and its helm, and that sort of the, for the sovereignty of the country, which is a very deep running sensitivity of the Turkish people, uh, we have to stand against that. And that, in a way, feeds into your previous question about Russia. Russia has been ready and able to um, to meet that narrative and present itself as a as a sort of a, a way for Turkey to protect itself from 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 U.S. manipulation. I think a number of these sort of different different uh, different layers. There was a convergence that really played into Russia's hands, and Russia played its hand very successfully as such. This is Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Today, we are talking with Nagar Guksel. Yeah, and you mentioned something, Nagar, and I, I, I want to uh, maybe turn this on a more personal side. And you and I have discussed this many times in the past, uh, having to do with the U.S. role in the coup, in the attempted coup in 2016, and how different perceptions have been about that U.S. role and how entrenched they've become. As you know, I was working for President Obama at the time, and I, I happened to be on a plane with Secretary of State uh, John Kerry, we were flying to Moscow to talk about Syria. When news broke and we heard on the plane about uh, news of this possible coup. And you've asked me in the past whether the U.S. knew about the coup, whether it, it had some involvement about it uh, in it beforehand. And I guess, as I told you then, it's conceivable that Secretary Kerry was the greatest actor of all times and he pretended he knew nothing about it. Or that he, despite being a senior cabinet official, was left in the dark about a plot that was made by others in the administration. That sounds pretty unlikely. And all I could say is that he seemed as genuinely surprised and as puzzled as everyone else on that plane and as much in the dark. Um, and he was on the plane with us trying to get in touch with our ambassador in the U.S. ambassador in Ankara to understand what was going on and what he should say and what he should do. So maybe as a, as a concluding thought, that one episode the role that it's had on Turkish perceptions of the U.S. and the difficulties of getting over those perceptions. You know, of course, there are many U.S. perceptions about Turkey that, are gonna, that may be wrong, that, that may be tough to overcome. But what did that whole episode of the coup and the perceptions of the U.S. role in it leave in you? What, did it, what parting thoughts do you have based on that for us in terms of Turkish-U.S. relations? Well, yes, Rob, I think it was a very, I mean, it really was the most critical turning point um, uh, in terms of where we are today in, in Turkey domestically and more strategic position-wise. And I think it's no surprise that, I mean, it's not no coincidence that President Erdogan's first trip after the coup attempt was to Moscow. As far as I know from my friends in Ankara from earlier years, Moscow was always warning um, uh, Turkish respective presidents 
<laughs> that the Gulen movement had CIA agents infiltrated into it. And this all sort of came together, uh, I think, and really brought Turkey and, 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 and President Erdogan and President Putin closer together. It also changed the power constellations in the Turkish state significantly. Uh, after the coup attempt, 180,000 civil servants were uh, purged. And in their place, you know, those who, who replaced them were largely sort of the nationalist left and the nationalist right. And they they came back with a vengeance to the United States. They were also the ones that they that thought they were the had been punished by the U.S. for advocating against the Iraq uh, invasion. So you know again it goes back to 2003, and they're all very entrenched now in the in the Turkish state. Um, and the Turkish public really only hears the narratives that that I had <laughs> asked you about. I'm I'm lucky to be one of the few in Turkey that actually has different outlets, different colleagues that I, that can sort of diversify the information that I receive. Uh, in terms of, of of how to move forward, I mean, of course, it's going to uh, depend also on on the presidential elections in the in the United States, but. Um, one thing that seems necessary is a, a more multi-tiered relationship with not just a president to president contact, but among from different among different institutions, a redefinition of, of the relationship, a re getting to know each other all over again, um, a building building trust and and sort of a better understanding of uh, the interests of both sides and where they meet and where they don't meet. Because when we actually think about it. Um, in all these conflicts in the neighborhood, maybe not everyone, but most of them, uh, Turkey's interests are much more aligned with the United States than they are with Russia in terms of the end game. Now, how to get to that conclusion is they often differ on, but what they actually want it to end up as, um, there's, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, and so I think there's a potential that's not being met right now. So Nigar, I want to, I want to thank you. It's always such a pleasure and, and so enlightening to talk to you. And this is obviously one of those topics that we'll be coming back to again and again. So really, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Robin Nas. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. So today, as I said, uh, Nas, we're going to proceed a little bit differently because we are in the middle of a war, a deadly war, a, a tragic war from the humanitarian point of view, the war in Nagorno-Karabakh that we spoke about last week. Last week, we had the chance to talk to Olesya Vartanian, who spends a lot of time in Yerevan and who understands and who lives and breathes the Armenian perspective on this war. But we also have, as I mentioned then, and this is again one of those attributes of a crisis group that I, that, that I so enjoy, is that we have an analyst in Baku, Zahra Shiriev, who works very closely with, with Olesya. And we thought, as this war is going on, that it would make sense because he's there, because the war is raging, because there's so much devastation, because he has such a personal and political perspective on this, that we should invite him on the podcast to talk briefly about his perceptions, his perspective, and what can be done in lieu of our weekly uh, review. So, Zaur, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. So I want to ask you, I mean, I know events, they can change quite quickly, quite dramatically, for the better, for the worst. And I know these days and weeks have been very difficult for you and your and your family, and you've been touched by by the war. Uh, and we're recording this on on a Tuesday, and as I said, things could change and may change by the time this uh, podcast is released. But I'd like if you could tell our listeners what is the situation like on the ground today. We know that there had been a humanitarian ceasefire brokered by Moscow, to which the parties said they had agreed. How's it translated on the ground? Yeah. Uh, uh... You are right, uh, the sides agreed on humanitarian ceasefire, but uh, the unfortunate humanitarian ceasefire was short-lived and fighting is ongoing. But all, at the same time, we hear the reports that International Red Cross is, is, will start to operate in the uh, combat zone. And so at least there is a still hope that uh, the humanitarian ceasefire will implement in the coming days. But at the same time, the fighting hasn't reached a point when the military leaders on the either, either side are ready for an operational pause. On the opposite, the situation continues to escalate with more strikes at places located kilometers away from the battlefields. Uh, we saw uh, the missile hit the second as big city of Azerbaijan in Ganja, but also we saw that the strikes to uh, the main town of the Nagorno-Karabakh and also other cities. So this is a real tragedy for population, especially civilians. So that's why I, I think the international actors should uh, react 
immediately to prevent a continuation of this uh, the humanitarian catastrophe uh, because this is very counterproductive to an eventual peace. Uh, this is hardening hostility, uh, perpetuating conflict and rendering a sustainable settlement more difficult. And and we spoke, as you know, uh, last week with your colleague, Olesia Vartanian, and I, I wondered if I could ask you, she, she helped us, I think, to in some ways um, better understand and articulate the understanding or the perspective of Armenia on this conflict. Could I ask you in some ways the same question? W- what do you see as the as the Azeri perspective on on this conflict and on what is uh, what is happening right now? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think uh, uh, before coming to your question, I would like to add one important thing because people are asking what's the cause of the war and why this is happening right now. I think when I think uh, uh, of the cause of the war, our slogan comes to my mind, the preventing war and the shaping peace. Uh, to me, these two ideas complement each other. Uh, preventing war does not lead to peace and you only lay the groundwork for another war if you spend all the resources on stopping the war and do not take steps to make peace. I think we see that this lack, this uh, the international intervention only focus on preventing the war. They didn't achieve advancing this uh, the negotiation between the sides. What's also always in a perspective here, I think Azerbaijan was interested in changing the status quo for a long time. So they, there was almost no confidence in the Azerbaijan society that the conflict will be resolved through the peace talks. This was especially uh, the case after the fighting on the international border areas in July. And tens of thousands of Azerbaijanis uh, took to the streets to demand the return of the land uh, by war. And at, this, at the same time, about 50,000 people volunteered to, for the ar- army. And so there, there has always been a kind of a sense that we can unite for Karabakh. And this demonstration has reapproved it as a social fact. So that's why no one's surprised that uh, why war happened right now. But there is no uh, clear understanding where it's going to stop and whether we can return back to the negotiation table. Uh, but also, I would like to add one thing that there is no trust to the international intervention in Azerbaijan because people, especially the, uh, the uh, displaced people, see this as a hypocrisy and ignorance of their rights. Because uh, for 26 years, I think they were waited that this uh, conflict will be resolved uh, this through the peace negotiations and they will return back to their uh, lands. And now it's, it's going to be much more hard to convince them that the only way of resolving the conflict is this through the peace talks. I often heard a hearing here right now also while talking to, pe- to people here that they say that we don't want to wait another 26 years or 30 years to see that uh, something will change. But unfortunately, I think the, the, the emotions are high, but we should be rational to think that okay, this is not a one-sided story or not, not only the one side can decide anything. So this is a two side and two sides should respect to each other. So Zaur, you know, obviously, you know, your despair comes across in your voice and your your feeling about the dehumanizing aspect of this war. I want to ask you, you explained, and I heard it several months ago when I was traveling with you in Baku and meeting with officials and meeting with displaced people, meeting with ordinary Azerbaijanis, that there was a strong sense of frustration that after 26 years, nothing had changed, nothing had moved in their direction. The status quo, as they saw it, was wholly benefiting Armenia and the Armenian side. You know, they, they just didn't see that there was any effort to help them recover what they thought was their own. So put yourself, if you will, in the shoes of the decision makers in Baku. Do you sense that their objective now is a purely military one? And how far do they think they can go militarily? Or was the military offensive designed as a wake-up call to let people know, to shake them up and say, there's no going back to the status quo ante. We need to get back to the negotiating table and we need to see real compromises. What's the mood as far as you can tell uh, from officials in Baku? Thank you, Rob. You're right. I think we always see that there, is, there was a frustration among the Azerbaijan decision makers. And uh, so especially this frustration, disappointment we saw more when someone questioned the basic principles because one of the core elements of basic principles for, was the withdrawal of Armenian troops from the adjacent territories. So right now, I think that as always a military strategy is not uh, that they would like to continue this war 
more weeks and more months. So I think there is a somehow they would like to see that diplomacy will play a role. So right now, uh, the main advancement of Azerbaijan army was in the southern direction. So we, we saw we hear very conflicting reporting. So uh, I think this is a what we what, what what we can call is a fake news. Each side says that oh, we advance, and other side says that you no, actually we advance. So we don't we don't have a very clear picture. But what I see uh, while hearing what as always decision makers say is that they would like to stop somehow, and they would like to see that uh, the international actors will come with a very clear. Uh, the plan that when and how the return of the territories will happen. So they would like to, they demand a very clear agenda and, and not imitation of the talks, but uh, real results. So then they will be able to convince Azerbaijan population that in the coming months or years, we can see real results. So, but I don't see that Azerbaijan army is, uh, or Azerbaijan decision makers is thinking that they can continue on the uh, returning of the lands by force, uh, so all it, because it's impossible task. So from geographical location and other other factors plays a role. Zahar, can I ask you one more question? And and to our listeners, I I would strongly recommend your your Twitter feed for information and perspectives on on this and other issues related to Azerbaijan. And um, the question is, in in uh, you had a recent thread in your Twitter feed where one of the things you talked about was a misperception in the media and in analysis about the role of of Turkey and the influence of Turkey in this conflict. And of course, connecting to to our second guest today. Could I ask you to say a bit about that? What is the perspective on the uh, extent of t- the significance of Turkey's influence uh, right now in this conflict? I think that uh, for Azerbaijan, Turkey, uh, Turkey is a very important ally and Turkey supporting Azerbaijan for many years. And also Turkey took part on the modernization of Azerbaijan army. So what we see right now is that Turkey is not supporting by words, but also by action. I think the critical thing is uh, the Turkish military equipment, also drones are playing an important role uh, in waging of the war. But I think uh, one of the, the misperception here, I think at least in the Indonesian media, what I see is that uh, people say that Turkey is, this, they personalize uh, the Turkey uh, and say that Turkey is intervening this uh, war and Turkey is, uh, it's not a, a Libya or the, the, the Syria because uh, the Turkey was uh, always here. Uh, so. What's the Turkish additional role is that we see that Azerbaijan announced that uh, Turkey should should become a part of the any negotiation from now on, and and Turkey should be uh, de facto or de jure part of the negotiation process. So we don't know how the, we can see the Turkish influence on this negotiation process, but this is uh, the one of the demands, the core demands of the, uh, the uh, decision makers in Baku. Zara, I want to thank you and uh, please uh, stay safe, you and your family. Thank you for your work and uh, hopefully for you and for everyone in the region. Hopefully this conflict will see an end sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you, boss. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Rob, that brings us to the part where you tell us what we should be reading from Crisis Group this week. So now there are two pieces I'd recommend uh, to our listeners to read. One is directly relevant to the conversation we just had with Zaur, and that is another statement by Crisis Group about the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, which uh, is continuing and in which we focus on the steps that need to be taken to reduce the suffering of ordinary civilians. And second, a really fascinating briefing on the ordeal of displaced people in Iraq. There are about one million of them. This briefing focuses on those who have some affiliation. It could be a very indirect affiliation. The father or the husband or some member of their family was a member of ISIS, and they now are suspect uh, and are treating as, as treated as suspect by people in their locations. And what we are looking at in this briefing is the hard time they're having reintegrating and living normal lives. They're in camps and they often are fearful or can't go back to the place, their places of residence. And as we argue in this, uh, in this briefing, this could be the source of the next wave of violence or of instability if they find no way to reintegrate 
into Iraqi society. A, a crucial issue and one that I think will affect people in many, many countries around the world. So strongly recommend that one. Well, that's it for this week. Uh, if you have any questions or suggestions for future guests or topics, feel free to let us know at media at crisisgroup.org. And if you're listening to us on iTunes, leave us a rating or a review. I wanted to send a thank you to the Crisis Group team responsible for putting the podcast together and everyone have a good week and we will be back next week hold your fire a podcast by the international crisis group